Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for Breakroom Conversations. My name is Krista Bradley and I'm the Director of Programs and Resources at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. In addition to the Zoom platform, we are also uh, welcoming viewers on Facebook Live. This session will feature ASL interpretation. We want to thank our signers, Gloria and Lydia, for their support today. Closed captioning will be available throughout the event and can be accessed by clicking on the closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom window as indicated. On Facebook Live, you can find Facebook's captioning option under the video player settings. If you have questions during today's conversation, we ask that you submit them using the Q&A box and put any general comments in the comments box. While we won't be taking questions from Facebook Live, we encourage you to engage in a dialogue with other viewers in the comments thread. APAC Breakroom Conversations is a unique series of virtual dialogues with leaders across our field. Artists, presenters, producers, agents, managers, funders, and other arts workers. And uh, we've been launched in a response to the current pandemic and calls for social justice in our country and the performing arts field. Industry influencers engage in meaningful and intimate discussions to share insights on innovation in the here and now while looking to reimagine and transform the future of the performing arts. Breakroom Conversations was inspired by and developed in partnership with Sozo Creative. We want to thank the Wallace Foundation for their support of this entire series and our work to help the field navigate through the COVID-19 crisis. We also want to acknowledge and thank Rena Shagan Associates for the generous support of this installment of the Breakroom series and thank Performing Arts Readiness, Readiness as today's intermission sponsor. Started in 1979, Rena Shagan Associates Inc. has grown to become one of the leading arts management firms in the world. President Rena Shagan is author of Booking and Tour Management for the Performing Arts, the Bible on booking tour management used by arts administrators worldwide. In January 2020, Rena won APEP's most important award, the Fan Taylor Prize for exemplary service to the field of performing arts presenting. She is also winner of Dance USA's Trustees Award for her outstanding work on behalf of the field of dance. We know how deeply Rena cares about the future of the field she's devoted most of her career to and wants to ensure it survives. We appreciate her support of important conversations like this one today to address issues that will be critical for our resilience and our future. This series was created in response to the COVID-19 crisis and its impact on the presenting, booking, and touring field. Our field has been in triage mode for months, working to stem losses, seek relief, and develop and share information to navigate this pandemic. And yet many realize we need to reimagine how we work, both now and in the future. We need to innovate our way through this crisis to recovery. Most importantly, we need to transform how we think and how we work. In this next session, we'll explore the many ways some of our colleagues are doing just that. I would now normally introduce the wonderful Madison Cario, our scheduled moderator and AD of Regional Arts and Culture Council based in Oregon. But Madison is unable to be here because of the climate crises and fires happening in their home city of Portland. Madison and the staff there have been evacuated and cell phone and internet access are spotty and unreliable. And so I am stepping into this moderator role today. Our thoughts and prayers are with all of you in Oregon and California as you face these wildfires and climate emergencies. And we send our best and ardent wishes for your health and safety. As a nation, we are facing multiple fires, figuratively and literally. The ongoing pandemic and its tremendous losses systemic racism, climate emergencies in the South and West, all impact our individual safety, our physical and mental health, and our entire communal equilibrium. Amidst the upheaval of everything we know and love lies our beloved performing arts community. As many of us grapple with staggering losses, colleagues are also trying to embrace this time as one of experimentation, a way to lean in to and discover their values and the things that matter most. They are challenging notions about how they've always worked and challenging funding partners and leaders 
to rethink their organization's value and impact. For them, innovation means questioning and leveraging their resources, giving back to artists and investing in community for social impact. Today, we have four amazing leaders who exemplify these experimental actions and these questions. And I'm so proud to bring in the first pair. Uh, we want to welcome Bob Bursey, Executive Director of Texas Performing Arts, and Sonia Clark of Art Park, Art Park in Buffalo, New York. Bob and Sonia, welcome to both of you. We're so glad to have you here. How are you doing today? Hey, Krista, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. And Sonia, it's we'd love to see you live. It'll be great to uh, have you live on here. There you are, fantastic, welcome. Well, it's so good to have you both. I know that um, you know each other from past work, so we didn't know that when we brought you two together, but you both are doing such incredible work in your different parts of the country. And I just wanna um, ground us in this conversation first and, and think about um, our sense of place, given kind of all the things that are happening and, and our colleagues are dealing with across the country. Thinking back on the past six months, how has the pandemic impacted your sense of place and belonging in your community? What's helped to sustain you both? That's great. Sonia, do you wanna dive into that? Oh, you're on mute, Sonia. On mute. There you go. Yeah. Well, Art Park is a stunning site. It's a, it's, a, it's a state park, it's a public park. It's a site of uh, tremendous geological history uh, and also artistic legacy. So the sense of place is, um, it's been very acute with us. Uh, I don't think we had to change that, that position necessarily. Art Park was uh, founded as an artistic organization on the ideas of cultural democracy and in our community is really embedded within everything that we do do. Of course, um, the, in March, a lot has changed where we're looking at this, so many others uh, at a very full season uh, of large scale events, uh, anything from Bonnever to Chicago and North Wind and Fire and, and Mocha Pazza and we had a flying ballet from vertical ballet from Spain del Reves and etc. Uh, of course we had to rethink all of that almost immediately but it came quite easily to us because a number of programs that were already in the planning were so connected with the site with the community um, more specifically um, our work outdoors with theater and live performance, uh, I have a background with that and a very special passion for it. street theater and um, uh, work with kind of site specific, I guess, live, live arts. So a lot of those things were already in the works and street theater is naturally uh, is a collaborative art form. You have to come out of and with your community. Uh, it comes out of a traditional basking, eventually involved in a very complex art form, but the, the nature of it really is very, very inclusive. And also art parks nature is very inclusive. So I think our sense of place has remained. We just focus zero in more on the very specific needs at the time. How can we help right now? And we really thought of that. And we offer nature fresh air. We offer distance uh, and a very safe environment for you to still enjoy yourself in, um, in, in, in the outdoors. And we bring arts into it. And with our relationship with New York State Parks, it was quite seamless. We were able to design a plan quite, quite fast and accommodate both of our artists and our audiences. And all those relationships, of course, are key. So that's my very long answer to your short question. I'll, I'll give Bob some space and, and talk about his program, of course. Mm, sure. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Coming to you from Austin, Texas, uh, which is the indigenous land of the Tonkawa, as well as the Comanche and the Apache moved through this area. So I'm grateful to be able to join you and to um, work and create on this tribal land. 
And um, I started this job here at Texas Performing Arts at UT Austin in January. So I honestly have very little uh, true sense of place uh, and no real authentic uh, belonging in this space, actually, which has been a really interesting and challenging dynamic uh, to navigate during this time. And it has keyed up for me, uh, an opportunity to work much more in partnership actually uh, with other organizations as we have sought to um, provide needed services or to create positive change and value in our community during this time. I really, really needed to rely on partner organizations that have much deeper knowledge and experience in the community in order to do that effectively. So I've really been trying to own uh, my own lack of knowledge uh, about this community and um, use that as an opportunity to invite other uh, perspectives and to see um, to a great extent uh, power and decision making to others as we try to think about institutional resource and what we can do during this time. Oh, I think you're muted, Krista. Sorry, Zoom veteran here. Um, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the whole uh, point of partnerships. That's that's sort of a running theme for us and how we're reimagining partnerships in this time. Uh, Bob, you've had to do it because you're you're new, uh, which I think is interesting, which raises and brings about some really great innovations that maybe some other colleagues could really uh, appreciate and learn from. And, and Sonia, I know that partnership is critical to the work that you've been doing already. So I'm, I'm just curious how um, your sense of partnership has evolved um, during this time. And if you could share a little bit of the ways that you've explored um, some unique partnerships in this time and place that, that uh, we've talked about in the past. I think for us, the, one of the reasons I'm here actually is uh, Rika and the Sozo artists. One of the first calls I made was to Sozo artists. And we were already in the, sort of in the midst of planning an artistic residency and the project with the Holiday Brothers. And the conversation evolved as to how can we modify it and make it happen or not. Uh, Holiday Brothers are based in Los Angeles. The art work, the art we were planning was very site specific. They were planning a sound score of art park, kind of a sound map of art park uh, activated by GPS. You wear your headphones and you go off on a trail with this uh, musical score that's specifically designed for our very vast, you see my background park and the trails. Um, immediately was apparent that the artist couldn't possibly uh, travel to Art Park, but we've managed technologically with uh, Sozo artists' help, how we can actually still work and make that work possible. And financially, we also have uh, modified our plans that made also we spread our residency into two parts, year one, year two. So let's accomplish what's manageable this year. Let's do the rest next year, for example. Same thing with Taylor Mack and the pomegranate artist. Again, we split that residency into two parts. He was still able to travel and create with his music director in a more sort of insular, I guess, setting, just focusing on internally on their work and the um, out, outward part of it would come next year where they would meet our audiences. And again, those conversations took place in a very partner-like or in really in the partnering relationships with these organizations first. And I'm incredibly uh, thankful to Rika and Shiza at Sozo Artists and Linda Gumbach at uh, Pomegranate Artists that sort of came together, were able to kind of design ways to still give, serve our community, uh, serve the artists. Part of our mission, let's not forget, is to nurture artistic talent. Uh, that's a conversation with our funders and our board as well, right? That's a partnership also when we went to funders and says, okay, well, normally a residency would entail an in-person interaction. For example, what, what about the artists who nurturing of their artistic talent, that, that's part of the mission, that's part of the service. You know, we can accomplish that. They don't have to necessarily travel uh, that in the times that it's not safe, but they also can be served and their work can be served as long as it's funded, as long as it's supported. So those are 
the other side of the conversations and the partnerships, right? Uh, so all of that took place and I'm very grateful to everybody involved. Our Native American community stepped in big time. They're all big partners and even came much closer. And this year we're on the Tuscarora and Seneca land, Iroquois nations, they've uh, we've designed a garden that they've created. And again, it was a partnership both in terms of uh, actual work and design and also ways to fund it and ways to plan it over a number of several periods of time rather than you know how it was originally approached. So that takes some strong relationships and trust uh, and, and really some open minds perhaps. Yeah, and you know, that's pulling in some of the, the conversations that we had from the earlier uh, half of this, which is how we think about um, partnership in and existing relationships that we have with artists and can we uh, if something doesn't turn out the way that we thought it would can we uh, separate things can we uh, phase things so that we're still fulfilling our mission as you've said or, or um, at least being true to artists and, and our partnership there so I appreciate you underscoring that um, Bob can you can you share how your your work has evolved and and how your looking at your work differently, particularly in service to um, community? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we've really leaned into collaboration during this time, uh, fully realizing that many organizations won't have the bandwidth to start new relationships or undertake uh, new programs. But in this one particular instance, uh, our organization, Texas Performing Arts, is working with the Fusebox Festival, which if folks don't know it, Fusebox is a really incredible annual global contemporary performance festival here in Austin that's been around for uh, 15 plus years, I think headed by uh, Ron Barry, the founder, uh, and also Anna Gallagher-Ross, the curator. And in our case, we wanted to stand up an artist residency program. And I have a fair amount of experience with residency and commissioning in my work, but there's very little recent precedent for it in Texas Performing Arts as organizational practice. It hasn't really been a focus uh, for TPA recently. Um, and so much effort in our field often goes into institution building uh, of staffing up for particular programs or, or building capacity around new initiatives. And in this case, we wanted to, rather than building our own capacity to do this, to use this as an opportunity to partner and work with another organization that I really uh, admired that was really uniquely positioned to help us uh, create an artist residency program focused on local Austin performing artists that um, Fusebox has a depth of curatorial knowledge, they have uh, creative producing capability, they have the ability to fiscal sponsor some independent artists that don't have management or representation in our community. And that was really key to helping us getting this going um, quickly. Uh, so a program that you know might have otherwise taken a, a year, 18 months, maybe more, to be strategically planned and funded and rolled out, we were able to put together uh, in a month or a month and a half and get this uh, up and running. So that really resonates with me, what you're saying, Sonia, about taking an initiative that you had hoped to accomplish and accelerating it during this time and also using it as an opportunity to widen the lens of the organization's practice. Yeah, Sonia, any thoughts about that? How it resonates for you? Um, how the widening their organizational practice? Is that what you yeah, I mean, I think that that's there's there's a piece of ramping up some of these things really quickly um, in times of crisis. And I think I know when we had a little bit of a planning call, we were talking a little bit about how. Um, how to navigate that role, particularly as, as leaders, right? And, and sometimes you have to actually speed things up and what, what kinds of resources, courage um, uh, that you need to be able to uh, help bring people along when you're in this kind of uh, time and space where you're, you're trying to work at warp speed, but also um, try to be visionary at the same time. So I wonder what, what, what does that conjure up for, for each of you actually? 
well, I think some of it I already described. Uh, the we, we did a number of such things this year. Uh, we jumped into a everything came from um, a very direct relationship and a question: who we're serving, how we're serving right here, right now, given our current. Um, well, life situations, and that's what artists always do when they do their best. And and I think it's up to us, the administrators, the producers, to give them the field, um, and give them the resources and 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 trust. You know, it takes courage to to do that. Uh, one of the programs we did is called Art of Walking. It's an urban walk, and originally we planned it. Um, as an international collaboration, uh, there's a group in Spain that I was uh, very interested in their work for a specific, specific reason. Uh, they had a certain pace to their live performance, a certain certain uh, mode and breath to it that I, I felt was very important to, um, to share with our audiences. And when this pandemic came, uh, it became even more so, more important. But that international collaboration was under question because it was meant to be as a co-writing of a new script, a whole new story, focusing on art park as a site. Uh, also with, with the purpose of providing some relief and meditative kind of experience to our audiences. Uh, but it's to be written by uh, international set of authors, uh, two of them in Madrid, one of them in New York City. Uh, and how do we merge New York State? How do we merge that now given the new uh, conditions? And uh, at first there was much trepidation. The, the uh, artists, they had a chance to meet uh, thankfully uh, earlier before this pandemic started briefly at our park with a site visit but when the work was actually to be done uh, they had big concerns we the authors with the writers we don't work like that online we don't work via zoom or skype we we need to see each other in person we need to be on the land and off the land in order to really produce the kind of work you're looking for which is art park and the art park story in the site um but after their first skype and their first zoom i got phone calls on both hands telling me that they're just in love and and this relationship is going to be extremely fertile and result is the very emotional story that provided for a great connection with Art Park as a site, a great relief to our audiences, a great fertile ground for the performers, uh, great new partnerships with New York State Parks and all the other partners that helped us along, Niagara Heritage area, etc. Uh, and that was expedited and, 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 and took a turn in itself almost that we had to sort of trust and move along and we were ready to present in early June because that, that technology, it's an urban walk where actors are speaking into headphones and audiences are wearing, wearing headphones and actors are speaking into the headsets. So that technology actually allowed for everybody to spread out and, and walk at their own pace in the park on the trail, just as it normally would be allowed in a New York State Park. Um, but again, we just had to, uh, all of us had to take a leap of faith to see if this would actually work. But um, I think uh, sometimes these kind of adverse conditions are, are that catalyst that creates some of the best work. Uh, I always say that the diversity is nothing new to an artist. Artist has al always been creating in, in, in all kinds of, every theater production we can think of, I'm a theater person, you know, every single production, I can't think of one that we wouldn't be thinking, oh, we're in a time of crisis at one point or another, right? And we have to take that leap. So I, I didn't see anything new in this condition, particularly here. The only point of courage, I guess, would be from um, organizational, institutional point of view, you know, we're, I think the concerns are on the side of really protecting our institutions than the artistic practice because the artists are always tuned in and ready and creative and those brains never stop and those imaginations are never on pause. I think it's up to us to find those, the, the administrators, the producers, the organizers, the enablers, I call myself enabler, that's my main title is to, to just find the resources and the tools for them to 
to do what they naturally do. And I think this summer for us was just another season, frankly. Yeah, interesting. And, you know, Sonia, there's something, you, one thing you said there that uh, especially um, struck a chord with me, which is around a question of resource allocation for organizations at this time. And I feel like that's been a, a real crux uh, for us because we, though we are part of a much larger institution of, of a university, less than 5% of our budget comes from that source. So we really are a self-sustaining enterprise, highly dependent on uh, ticket sales in our present business model. And so we have reduced staffing. Uh, we have made really difficult decisions about how to sustain the organization during this time. And also we are investing resources in creativity and artistic practice and fulfilling our mission. And that feels to me uh, like a, a really freighted decision and an important one, but there is also an argument to be made that in the interest of organizational sustainability, the other thing to do would be to pull back as much as possible. That is a model that some organizations in our field are following. And from my perspective, I, I haven't been willing to sort of cede that territory uh, to essentially say that the work that we do doesn't matter because my feeling is that the work we do does matter. And I'm trying to find that balance of sustaining the institution going forward during this time and also making those investments uh, in artists and for us local artists in particular. And I wonder how have you navigated that uh, in your organization about that, that tension between um, sustaining the organization going forward and continuing to deliver on your mission during this time? That's a hard one. That's a hard one. That, I think that's where the sort of the, our vulnerability come, comes in. It's a hard one. There are institutions that do have an endowment, for example, our park doesn't. Uh, we rely almost entirely on earned revenues. Our contributed revenues is a, is a very small slice of the pie and we lost it all, of course. So going back to our sponsors that I don't consider contributed revenues, if you ask me, it's more of a transactional uh, relationship. So going back to our sponsors that normally would sponsor a concert where they would get a skybox and all kinds of branded exposure, right? And have that conversation, will you stay with us through this? Uh, going back to our funders, uh, existing grants that had to be retargeted somewhat by a foundation. Some did it, some didn't. Uh, there are those that I, I, I have to be, I'm so grateful to NISCA and our local column foundation, m and Bank, those are the institutions that really stayed, no matter, we're with you, we trust your artistic vision, do what you got to do with there. Uh, and, and sponsors that did the same thing and also our community and the board. So this is these are all the tools that allowed us to stay through. Of course, we're still in a very, very, very vulnerable situation. We had a conversation with our audiences where uh, a lot of our large scale concerts moved over to next season and then it looks like it might be moving over to 2022. We're having those conversations with our audiences. Uh, will you stay with us? Will you transfer some of your funds uh, to a donation or a credit, right? How does that work? Those are tough conversations and something you as a producer never want to find yourself in, but yet we do, right? Uh, so this is how we, we've made it through. It's not over. We're definitely not out of the woods. We're more into the woods, but I think having created that extra new trust, I think this summer, having provided some of that emotional need and relief to our community, hopefully it will also pay back even more. Um, but right now that, that sort of, those are conversations that got us through. Krista, you are on mute. I know, I just realized that. You both are providing such relief for, for lots of people. And, and I'm struck by uh, the importance of partnership um, that you need to be able to sustain your, your, yourselves too, and just how you're sort of being able to step into the future and, and be innovative. We have hit our first intermission of our, of our time together. So um, I'm looking forward to bringing you back after we talk with our next 
team and pair. And I suspect that that will be a really uh, wonderful conversation. So thank you, Bob and Sonia. And welcome, Pam Taji and Mark Bamudi Joseph. We're so happy to see you. Um, we uh, have our second, our second duo here. Pam Taji is Executive and Artistic Director of Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival. And Mark Bamudi Joseph, artist, activist, awesome person, Vice President and Artistic Director of Social Impact at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC. Good to have you both. Um, thanks for being here. Hey. Hey, hey. Um, so that was here. an interesting initial conversation. I'm, I'm, I didn't realize it at the time, but I'm struck by the, the fact that the two of you both work for uh, legacy institutions which I know must bring a um, unique set of uh, circumstances and, and expectations and, and pressures, particularly in times like these. Um, so I, 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 wanna, I wanna push on that a little bit. Um, knowing that there are probably existing tensions between the call for you to be visionary and bold, which you both are, and the tension in, uh, to sustain your organizations. Curious about how, how the last six months have affected you. How has it amplified um, or impacted those tensions for you as leaders in these organizations and knowing how you're kind of wired to be bold and visionary people? Have at it. You wanna grab that, Pam? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start um, just to say thank you so much for having me and it's great to be in conversation with uh, Bamuti. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, never could I have imagined that this 88 year old uh, dance festival, that's the longest running dance festival in the United States, that I would be presiding over a time where we would not have a festival. And uh, when uh, that sort of that that in that unknowing uh, came so much, uh, I think, creativity from my staff, from my board, and uh, as well as grief. I can't say that there, you know, for the 50 companies that, that we uh, canceled their engagements with us, uh, when the, the almost 100 um, pre-professional dancers in our school, I mean, so much that, that had to, that we had to go through and we had to acknowledge that we were all grieving for a period. So there was a grieving period, right? And, and then uh, there was a period of, okay, how are we gonna fulfill our mission? And I really um, resonated with the conversation that we just had, particularly this sense of place. How could we continue in this time to connect people to this place that is people's sacred place? I mean, for many of our current audiences, this is an annual pilgrimage. It could be a weekly, daily pilgrimage. 40% of our audience every summer is new to uh, Jacob's Pillow because it's a destination. It's a place you wanna visit once in your life. Mm -hmm. So how could we translate our work in the service of our community of artists uh, into a new form? And the form, we, when we sort of took a look at the very strict guidelines of Massachusetts, we made the decision that um, we were going to go all virtual, that there was, we didn't, couldn't imagine a way that we could have, um, live performances for any number of people that would make any financial sense. And so we took this leap and it, it happened very fast. And we put together an eight week festival, 38 events, only 20% of them were pre-recorded from our archives. The rest were created new. And, you know, uh, that, that has been, uh, it, was, it was a huge muscle flex for a staff that had been decimated. 40% of our staff was, we had to lay off. Uh, we had to get learn new skills. We were we were in this moment of um, of uh, very important creation because we felt it, that it was so necessary to stay connected with our audience. We had two goals: connect with the audience and uh, reach new audiences. See what a digital presence could do for you know reaching new people. And the demo democracy of that uh, really motivated people, I think, and also the service to the artists who, who could, the, the artists who we were able to feature in this way. So the, the tensions between, um, you know, uh, so, so, you know, we have COVID and then we have the social upheaval and we have um, a moment where we realize, and, and I know we're going to get to this a little later on in the conversation, but 
but how how are we going to do what we have to do now, which was that virtual festival, while at the same time beginning to vision what the future is going to look like, knowing that this was going to be eight weeks and then we would have a moment to really reflect on, on what's next. And um, so I'll just end with, uh, yes, there's a tension between uh, an, an audience that wants what it wants and our desire to reach new audiences, but the, the audience that, that cares deeply about Jacob's Pillow, first of all, that the expressions of care and concern were so overwhelming. Holding people's grief at that time was quite something. At the same time, that audience is motivated to see us succeed, to see us innovate, to see us chart new territory in, in exciting ways. So I, I've only felt at this point support in, in making sure that we are, we are seen through this, uh, this journey. Um, so I'll just, I'll just stop there. Um, I'm, I'm fighting the urge to, um, I'm, I'm fighting my natural inclination to say stuff that might get me in trouble, but fuck it. So, <laughs> because the word legacy is troubling me. The word legacy is very complicated to me because I, I work at an institution that is, um, uh, that has support from um, the federal government is a living memorial to our 35th president, um, John F. Kennedy, and um, will celebrate its 50th anniversary in September of, 19, of uh, 2021. So, uh, so just about a, a year from now, um, assuming we're all here a year from now. And the the, the thing about being intertwined with the federal government is that there are competing legacies. Um, there's a very intricate uh, way that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm so grateful, you know, for, for Bob and Sonia um, invoking um, uh, the ancestral inhabitants of the respective spaces that, um, that they operate in. Um, we are, um, there, there are, are legacies within a, a kind of federal expression of arts patronage and arts discipline and understanding that we don't necessarily need to bring with us. We don't necessarily need to bring, bring forward with us. And so um, I am an artist, I am a writer, I, I um, believe most in um, collaboration and um, in exploding legacy, to be very honest. There's, um, there's ancestral accountability, which I believe in deeply. Um, there is um, history, um, which I believe is multivalent and has to be studied and shared. Um, but beyond those accountabilities and those histories, my artistic self wants to um, author future. And a lot of what that often means is direct confrontation with institutional legacy. So um, the, my personal struggle outside of the, you know, there've been some um, ways that the Kennedy Center I think has made missteps. Um, and there's some things that the Kennedy Center has done um, really well over the course of the last um, six months that the, the um, platform that I think we're most proud of is Arts Across America, which engages regional arts organizations, um, six of them to broadcast every day at four o'clock, a different artist from a different state in the union. By the time we get to December, we will have paid and showcased and provided a platform for artists from all 50 states in the um, digital sphere, tens of thousands of, um, of folks watch this, and that's a kind of practical exercise. Um, but I think the more urgent exercise is actually to um, uh, to re-engage our legacy. And um, especially with a formidable president, um, uh, Deborah Rudder, and a, you know, and a great staff to come together and um, rethink what that word means 
as we co-author in a collaborative way um, a, a different kind of legacy in the face of political tensions, in the face of environmental um, disaster and climate crisis, in the face of virological crisis, the, maybe a, a different way of looking at that question, Krista, is what do we want our legacy to be emerging from this moment of concurrent crises? Maybe a little less like, how have we maintained the narrative as it's been authored thus far? And a little more like, um, you know, what am I supposed to say to my grandchildren when they ask me what I did in the time of the flood, in the time of the fire, in the time of this moment of upheaval? Did I sit down? Did I struggle to try to go back and maintain what we did? Or did I move dynamically forward? It's complicated, clearly, but that's just what comes up for me when you ask that question. Uh, Pam, you look like you want to say something. Are you... No, I think that um, I think that uh, the great opportunity of this moment is to um, is is to chart a new future and think about who's charting that future. And uh, as uh, uh, contextualizing uh, our history, uh, is something that um, it, it's something that probably should have been in our statement of commitments that we made uh, in June. Uh, and as a staff, we have really said that in, unless we do that, we really we really can't be grounded uh, as an organization, as an institution, in order to move forward. Unless we truly understand that that history. So I'm glad you you brought that up. I'm struck with the authoring of the future. I really like that term. Um, and, and, and we've talked a lot about um, our tendency collectively as a field and many of us in the field want to go are just trying to tread water, um, you know, so that we can go back to something. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, um, I think that you all don't share that, um, you know, that that's that maybe going back isn't the call right now. <laughs> um, and, and so I wonder how that's how that's pulling you forward and what kind of innovations and like, you know, explorations you're you're pursuing now that are challenging and difficult, but but driven by like that back does not work and that back is unsustainable. Um, you know, how how has your perspective changed about that? And and what new practices are you exploring and putting forward? Do you want to go first, Bamuti, for this one? Sure, thank you. Um, perversely, ironically, um, this is a moment that many of us are kind of built for. Um, and it's uh, tragic and unfortunate that it's come to this, but um, many, you know, as I as I look to my my James Baldwin cat, you know, candle right in front of me, and just um, the iconography that's um, that surrounds me, um, this is this moment, um, this critical moment is is something that many of us in the arts have been um, not predicting with, but just living with. So the um, the irony of um, these concurrent crises affording us enough political capital and political cover to um, move a little bit more um, expeditiously towards a more expansive, inclusive, and inspired future um, is something that many of us, I think, are um, uh, are, are thinking about in terms of um, systemically embedding um, what used to be resistance into the institutionality of our respective um, organizations. So um, we at the Kennedy Center made a statement on June 2nd. There was a um, performative um, symbol that accompanied um, the statement that we were really proud of. And then we went quickly to work 
um, moving from statement to system, moving from symbol to state, moving from statement um, or symbol to um, system. And, and what we said at the time was, if we think that if, if we think that racism is structural, then anti-racism also must be structural. If we, if, we, if we dare to use the phrase systemic racism, then anti-racist practice must also be systemic. So what we outlined was eight different channels of practice. We talked about investment in local creative economies. We talked about activating our space through the lens of public health. We did commissioning projects or we started commissioning projects um, through something called cartography where we, um, uh, where we uh, supported um, commissions in eight different cities from composers um, and librettists who were responding to extrajudicial violence in those cities. So a composer from Louisville in honor of uh, Breonna Taylor, a composer in Aurora, Colorado, in honor of Elijah McClain and, and so forth. We had the Arts Across America initiative. We um, said we were going to do um, uh, have a different level of investment in cultural leadership. Um, we talked about an initiative called Black Culture Matters, which doesn't just highlight, um, you know, Black artists and narratives and literacies, but connects um, those artists and literacies to individuals and organizations that are doing anti-racist work in the areas of housing and law, um, beauty, health, um, like this. Um, so we went from statement, symbol, system, um, but really, man, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. So the vision is 25, 25, 25, to have 25% of all of our programming be impact facing by the year 2025, five years to get there and to invest $25 million in order to get there. 25 million by 2025 in order to get to the place where 25% of our um, programming is impact facing. Um, now, uh, can we do that? Can we um, take that vision and implement it? Well, um, that's the space that we're in right now is figuring out how to take that vision statement and lock it down. And that's what my team is currently doing is setting up a, um, a series of rubrics um, so that the organization learns exactly how to get to 25% um, impact facing. Um, and, and maybe I'll just talk about that um, a, a little bit later, what those rubrics are, how we define impact facing and, um, and so forth. But the, you, you know, I'm proud of where we have gone. I'm proud of what we're doing. I'm proud of how fast we're working because it is a massive, massive ship and we are collectively in a place of detriment and crisis. Um, but this is why I think it's really important to articulate a clear vision, a clear path forward, um, and also to lay down the dollars, yo, to lay down the dollars. Um, racism is a vehicle through which capitalism works. So if, you're, if you want to be anti-racist, you have to, um, rethink your position on capitalist inve investment and expenditure. Um, and that's the hard place. That's the sticky place, but I think we can make it through. That's so amazing. I want to go back to that, but I want Pamela, Pam, do you want to respond to that? I'm just, yeah, I'd, I'd love to first ask you to just tell us what you mean by impact facing Bamuti. Um, yeah, what, what I think of imp as impact facing is um, programs that are scaffolded that directly engage the social contract. Mm -hmm. um, we, we tend to think of community in amorphous terms. Um, impact facing work names the community, has community specificity. Um, impact facing work confronts historical discrimination, historical um, uh, communities that have been historically um, stigmatized. So it's not just anti-racist, it's anti-stigmatization. Um, it engages our divisive history. Impact facing work operates under a modality that is scaffolded, is collaborative, leads with listening. Impact facing work is driven by outcomes. Um, impact facing work seeks to be um, change agent work. 
Um, but it has to, and impact facing work um, has an expanse of personnel. So it's not just like your community engagement department that's doing it. It's not just like your social impact department that's doing it. If it's to have impact, it also has to change the organizational culture. So those are some of the things. Awesome. I so appreciate that specificity. Sure. Because so much of the work that we do when we talk about this is less specific. So. That's right. No, I think it's, and it just sort of, I, I just went right back to, um, I, I worked at Wesleyan University for almost 17 years and co-founded a program with Sam Miller called the Institute for Curatorial Practice and Performance. And we always asked Bamuti to come and give a lecture <laughs> that would just, you know, turn everybody's <laughs> head around particularly when he was at Yerba Buena thinking about what if curatorial practice was community driven. And I just had that moment listening to you right now. And uh, uh, thank you for that inspiration because we, we all need it. Um, and we need it uh, spoken the way only you can do, Bamuti, really. So uh, I'll represent the, um, the, the white led organizations who are, who are grappling with, uh, with these questions right now. Um, we made our statement on June 5th. Uh, and uh, I would say that the biggest uh, shift we've, we've been engaged in, I would say equity, diversity, inclusion and access work and we call it idea work. We reorder the letters. We, we've been invested in idea for the past four years in a, in a serious way, but, but everything changed, everything became clear that everything had to be accelerated. And so uh, luckily we had a, a framework uh, for engagement uh, with a, an incredible trainer, uh, Gwendolyn uh, Van Sant of um, Bridge in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And she uh, immediately uh, began to work with us as a staff. We decided to focus in on our team first with the idea that we have to understand how to make these uh, commitments that we made real uh, as a group. And we took what was a task force, an idea task force, and we said, this is the, the objective, the priority of the entire staff. And uh, so that was the big change where everyone realized it was their responsibility that, they, that we all have a role. And then we realized that um, we couldn't really go to action on our commitments until we created a climate for change, that there needed to be uh, certain considerations, certain trainings, uh, certain knowledge making for the board. The board has had training, uh, but needs more training. Uh, so what, what, what is our plan going to be there? How are we gonna think about the wellness and retention of this staff that has been so, um, uh, put upon to, to make this pivot uh, with us. How are we going to now make space for them to make space for this, uh, th these commitments that we've made? So um, I would say that the first thing I knew I needed to do was, um, I would say before COVID, I was in search of a, a guest curator, but I made the decision that instead of having one that I was looking for, I, I decided to search for two associate curators who would uh, expand our uh, curatorial team beyond me and our uh, producing director, Ariana Massery. And so I, I wanted there to, be, um, there to be a balance as opposed to a single, I wanted, I wanted a, a, a team to work with me to vision uh, both our fall and spring pillow lab, which is our residency program, as well as our festival. So, will be um, announcing uh, who, who those people are shortly. Uh, we also um, have um, made a commitment to the fact that we are a place of retreat, of regeneration, of renewal. Um, how could we provide uh, COVID compliant residencies at, at this time? What would we need to invest uh, in artists so that we could make our spaces available? And what sort of resources are artists gonna need who haven't been together, uh, haven't been working together? So something uh, I would say that I was very impacted by the Creating New Futures uh, uh, document in terms of thinking about how we compensate artists, uh, a planning fee for uh, residencies, uh, a fee for working with uh, videographers to come up with a, a, a product at the end of, of a residency. 
um, thinking uh, differently about transparency in terms of budgeting. We're all in this together. We don't, we've, we've you know, what is it going to take to have a company tested three times before they get in a car to, um, to come up to Jacob's Pillow from New York City, for example? How are we going to balance that? So a, a kind of partnership and a, hopefully a beginning to level a bit of the hierarchy that, that exists by being transparent about what we have and don't have what we can and can't do at this time. So that those are... Those are some of the um, initial thoughts. And, and I would say, you know, something really powerful that we made a commitment to last summer when we um, uh, began to, we, we sort of uh, created a, um, a ritual that would enable us to begin having a land acknowledgement that was grounded in the tribal peoples who uh, uh, have the, the traditional lands that we, that we dance on and sort of what, what did, how could we build on this gathering that we had last summer to continue our commitment to indigenous uh, work? So there's a lot um, swirling around. It takes time. It takes uh, to, to manage the uncertainties of the future, the lack of resources, and this incredible commitment to making change happen is, 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 you know, our, is my challenge as the leader of this institution. And to be, I think, transparent with my staff and board as to what we can and we can't achieve. Um, but it is a time, like, to, to stop the machine that was Jacob's Pillow, you know, to pause it, to see how do we lean into being an outdoor performance uh, site? How do we connect with our land, with our history in new ways? I think that uh, we're, we're seeing sort of 21 into 22 as a, a kind of... Um, a year of innovation, exploration, uh, experimentation, and mm -hmm. um, and included in that is this, you know, creating a a, a new future. Mm -hmm. This is a this is maybe a good time to bring in some other folks. I just there's some things that you've raised up, um, and I just love this whole leveraging of your not leverage. I don't want to use that word, but just recognizing the the space and resources and privilege. Um, we have, you know, as organizations um, on borrowed land or like the resources that we have to um, level the field with the partners that we say that we, we want to engage with, I think is really an important conversation when it comes to anti-racism and how we as presenters and artists work in tandem. You know, so I want to, I want to bring in um, Bob and Sonia and uh, see if we can uh, open up that conversation a bit. And there's some questions that have been uh, coming through the chat, but I wonder, Bob and Sonia, have you heard this conversation? Are there things that are resonating for you um, in some of the themes that, that have emerged? Yeah, I, I mean, so much and such incredible uh, work and vision. I think that Pam and Bamuti, um, you're both bringing forward in your organizations. Um, I guess I would love to hear from both of you, if I may ask a question, uh, just what has been sustaining you during this time? I think you, you both pointed to the, um, maybe burden is the wrong word, but right, the, the gravity and the responsibility of organizational leadership during this time. And, and how have you been navigating that professionally, personally, however, whatever direction you want to take that. I'd be really curious to hear. I'll, I'll do this one first. I mean, I, I think I'm going to be honest, there's, there's good days and there's really hard days. And, yeah. uh, and I think what gets me through is when I get an email from an artist uh, saying, uh, I, I, actually, I, I actually wasn't sure I was going to continue until you called me. You know, and to to sort of understand uh, how important Jacob's Pillow is in the ecology of an of of the the life of dance artists in in this country in this world, and what a responsibility it is. Uh, but so to have a piece of feedback from an artist or uh, someone who you know just narrates to me that 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 the Thursday night at seven o'clock was, was the moment they looked forward to each week to be able to participate and be transported 
and and the kind of um, connections. And I think if we have this uh, group called Pittsfield Moves, it's a group of uh, um, community stakeholders who believe in movement as a social change uh, action. And uh, they were founded as a collective in 2017 by Paloma McGregor's Angela's Pulse, working with us in a, in a co-creative way. And they have been sustained uh, as a group through weekly uh, Zoom calls. And many of them actually are, are service providers and essential workers in our, in our community. But the fact that they want to move and talk and share each week and that that has kept going, it's the fact that in this, in this time of despair, and it is despairing on, yeah. on, on days, some days more than others, that they're, that we are giving people hope. That is what sustains me. That's what gets me up in the morning. I don't have any choice, but I have to, I have to keep this work going. Mm. Pamela, Pam, that's, um, that's really, um, it's so beautiful. I, I appreciate your transparency, Bob. I really appreciate your humility and deference. I, you're such a great journalist. Thank you for um, for the question. Um, somebody uh, asked in the chat if it's if we think that passing through symbol on the way from statement to system is an important step, and um, in a lot of ways, it's the symbols that are sustaining. That actually is our gig, you know. Like we run institutions, we run organizations, these are businesses, the businesses are rooted in public and or private um, space. Um, but we are in the business of, of trafficking vision. Um, and the semiotics of that, the symbolism of that, the beauty of that is uh, we make it apparent. You know, we, there's a, I want to say there's something that I stole from Malcolm Gladwell, um, where he, he talked about it's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And he says that um, in part because the end of the world has been laid out for us. We, uh, Will Smith is the star you know, or George, or, you know, it's, it's, or, uh, you know, Captain Kirk is, is on the precipice, like we've seen it, you know, Darth Vader, like we've seen the epic battle. Um, art tells us where to go. The symbols that we make musically, kinesthetically, figuratively, um, they are our teachers, you know, they're our teachers. And so the the grace, you know, Kennedy says a nation is only as great as it is graceful. It's a powerful thing to say. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful um, maxim to hold, uh, particularly when we have such an inarticulate and principally garbaged person in our highest office. We need symbols. We need symbols to to carry us through, and I I agree with Pam and I and Sonia and Bob. I, I'd love to hear what is sustaining you right now. But um, you know, for me, it's it's family, it's um, the incredible team that I uh, work with, the incredible team of artists that I work with. Um, you know, just premiered a, a piece last week with um Jacqueline Buglisi that we were talking about and uh, Daniel Bernard Romain. It's it's incredible people like Rika Aino, but it's symbols, the symbols of the poetic, the poetic symbols that suggest that another world is possible. You know, that's that's been sustenance. I wonder how it's been for you two. Or what it's been for you two. I would say for me, there's, uh, despite all of the really, really significant challenges, there is also a sense of possibility or opportunity 
in this moment, which I think um, you all have reflected on so beautifully and eloquently is that there, there really are cracks in the system and we've had an opportunity to expose so many of the things that don't work well about this field. And there is this uh, momentum if, if we're able to envision it and seize it uh, to be able to really act on those things. And it feels very kind of live because as organizational leaders, you're also feels to me like really holding the livelihood of your teams and your organizations right in your hands and, and making decisions that have more gravity on a day-to-day -day basis, more implications for the livelihood of our communities uh, than normal. And there is some uh, also positive to that, right, in that, that we can move assertively uh, to uh, be courageous and, and act with vision as we try to come through this time has been something that's been you know motivating, sustaining to me, coupled with like a healthy dose of just total outright fear of yeah. you know, running the place into the ground and, and why I'm investing in artist residencies instead of making sure I can you know carry our debt burden for the next five years or whatever. Um, I, I can definitely share Bob sentiment there and like so many we had to make those decisions where can we make a difference what is our mission what is what how what is our role right now and at the time it felt the role is in the providing the inspiration and that connection with nature via the arts that's where our work steps in uh, and then when the mission is right, when the action is right, when the you are indeed in, in the right service to your audiences, to your community, uh, I'm a big believer, I guess, optimist that hope does come most of the time. Not always, but it's terrifying, it's horrifying, but really believing that you're under, the most important work you have is right here, right now. Um, and, balancing, of course, the sort of the sustainable model and what is it going forward because we don't know what 2021 is going to be either at this point, right? Uh, and, and what is sustainable? Uh, smaller scale events paired maybe with um, live streaming to a larger audience. Uh, how does that work? How is that sustained? What is the quantitative results versus qualitative result. How do our funders see that? Uh, where is our biggest impact? Is, is providing relief to one human being who writes to you and says, my perspective on life has changed, thank you. Is that worth $100,000? I think it does, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but we have those keys in our hands and it's terrifying and it's horrifying too because they're also livelihoods of our staff. There are livelihoods of our community that are affected in very different ways from our actions. Our park is a large institution in a small village and large crowds, large events do sustain the life actually in our own community, economically speaking. So if we're not focusing on that, what does that do to to our community as well, right? Um, so th these are very big questions and I don't necessarily, I can't say I have the answer, but we have to have a certain amount of trust, I guess, in our society and in our community and the support system that will get us through this as well. We know what the right thing is, which is the artists have the vision. The artists are the, uh, what did you say, the, um, earlier you said something about so they 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 traffic we're trafficking the vision the artists <laughs> know the right thing we our job is to really uh, make this available to the community and make this possible through our whatever resources we got at hand and sometimes it just means looking at the sea of red Bob you <laughs> said to have that term and I I I, I would agree. So how do we plan for 2021, which again, potentially probably is not very profitable for any of us, but realigning that, you know, the role that we're serving with, with survival. Yeah. Big questions. I don't have those answers right now. <laughs> I was hoping you did. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> uh, 
um, uh, we've had a couple of questions about this whole impact facing idea, uh, Bamudi, that you put out there. And, and um, I want to sort of weave that in here because I think a lot of people would all <laughs> say that they want to be impact facing based on the rubric that, you know, what you laid out there. So what, one of the questions um, is, um, does impact facing also look at leadership <laughs> and um, management? Um, you know, does that, you talked about like, obviously your budget and resources, but just what does that mean for leadership and institutional culture? Um, wonder what, how you might answer that. Yeah, I mean, it, ultimately, the the organizational culture is crafted by the people that live in the organization when when pam takes over jacob's pillow you know when bob takes over um in austin those respective organizations are going to be molded by their character their personality their um their sense of, um, of commitment with a deep understanding of where they were, but this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to alter the trajectory of not just the organizations that we, um, that we work at, but the cities that we live in. I mean, so impact literally means change. It, it literally means um, to move the ball forward. My predecessor, uh, at the Kennedy Center had um, Garth Ross, who I love. Garth, I don't know if you watch him, but shout out. Love you, dog. <laughs> he, was the, he was the vice president of community engagement. And as, we, um, as I was interviewing for the position, um, the, the leadership at the Kennedy Center, and I agreed that that wasn't the right paradigm. I, you know, maybe because I've worked in the Bay Area for so long and some of the lexicon of, of Silicon Valley has, um, has trickled down, but I, you know, I offered that um, social impact was a more appropriate, more compliant framework for community facing work because impact implied a little bit more than engagement, um, which is kind of transactional. It in, impact implies outcome, which, you know, if we're going to do this work, we have to cultivate a sense of shared stakes and shared responsibility. And if we share stakes, then, um, you know, then we're not thinking about um, our communities as like um, proportions in a zero sum game. We're not saying here's the amount of work that I need to do with the trans community and here's the amount of work that I need to do with, you know, the elder community and, and, and so forth. We, we begin to share stakes. Who's going to share the stakes most but folks that come from that community? So, yeah, if you're going to be outcome driven in an ethical way, then um, your hiring practices, your HR policies, and your curation will reflect that. Mm -hmm. So, but you, but there has to be a tipping point. Um, Rika invoked this fifteen percent of budget threshold, which I think is great. Like I'm, you know, I, I'm first generation American. My parent, you know, my people were are from Haiti. I identify as Black with a capital B. We're thirteen percent of the country. Yeah, you know, thirteen percent at a minimum, you know, in terms of programming and staffing and and et cetera. But it's not as easy as those as those kinds of rubrics. So, what's the tipping point of programming for your organization that then changes the organizational profile in terms of who's on staff, where you get your funding? Um, uh, you know, who you're thinking about in terms of donor partnerships, it, you know, et cetera. There's a, there's a, um, there was a moment this past weekend where um, one president, one former presidential candidate was calling out, you know, Joe Biden, you know, around um, a, a lack of focus on the Latino community. 
we all have blind spots. We all do. You know what I mean? It's, it's so, so who's around us to help us avoid our blind spots? Generally, our blind spots um, are shaped like us. Mm. So who's around us that um, fills in the shadows, that fills in the blanks? You know, and if there's, if it's 20% of your programming or 25% of your programming or 30% of your programming that does this work, then now the organizational discussion changes. Now the iconography changes. Now your audience changes now. So it does have to be holistic. Otherwise it's that department over there doing that work with some support. It has to literally be integrated in your whole ethos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've just frozen on a very good note. <laughs> um, I wonder, we have about four or five minutes. And I just wonder, um, as, as Bamuni was going through some of those rubrics, I think that are part of this social, social impact work, what that uh, brings up for you. One of my final questions was just, you know, do you think that we can be accountable, innovative, and sustainable all at the same time? Final thoughts? on that before I bring in our awesome fearless leader to close us out. I'm sorry, Krista, can you just ask that question again? I froze and missed the first half of it. Yes, I was, I was, I was saying that, um, uh, you know, the, what you were just explaining about the thoroughness and like the whole, uh, the, the holistic part of how to sort of make all this stuff happen um, is maybe part of the rubric that you're talking about, right? And so my question, um, to your colleagues, you know, how do, what does that resonate for you? And can organizations really be accountable, innovative and sustainable all at the same time? Because I think that's probably what everyone's trying, you know, they're inspired by what we're saying and by what you're saying, but they're looking at like the deficit and they're looking at their truncated staff and trying to make sure that they can hold on to their staff and they want to be visionary and they're committed to being anti-racist organizations. So, you know, can can organizations do all these and 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 what would you offer uh colleagues trying to navigate those things i think that to, to to do this work authentically it takes time and it's it's really it's such a hard uh this is this is a real hard paradox right because we have to urgently act we have to urgently put plans in place that are sustainable so that we can be accountable etc but in order for them to truly take root so that the organizational transformation can change you have to take the time to to be messy to to take risks to have things fail and i think that's what we all have to navigate and, and be kind and patient to ourselves with ourselves in the doing of that. So that's one thing I would say. And I think, you know, something that if, if I'm, I'm going to be asking myself, and it's something I've been asking for a while is for an institution that has actually had, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a really diverse program. Uh, we have not succeeded in diversifying the audience, the staff, the board, and so um, so that's what our that's what we're accelerating is uh, is by um, changing structures in the organization by having an outside external review of our processes uh, by BIPOC artists and practitioners to sort of say what are the structures that are inhibiting this tipping point from happening so that we we. We, we chart that path and it's a journey. It's, and, and, and I think it's the, it's the patience that we all, we all need in, you know, alongside the urgency. So I just, I put that out there as my thought. Yeah, I, I feel like the, um, I've been really inspired by the creativity and the responsiveness and the sense of experimentation that's been demonstrated throughout our field uh, during this time and the, the capacity and then the will to work more fluidly and uh, imagine possibilities for the future that are different uh, than the kind of foregoing body of practice that's built up around this work. So 
I am optimistic, right? To that, that question really drives at the heart of it about accountability, sustainability, and innovation. And I, I feel like um, given the incredible um, capacity of, of the people who make up uh, our field that that is possible going forward. Sounds great. Sonia, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm thinking about what is the role of our audience in, in all of this and what is our role in terms of leadership and education. Um, some of our institutions that do have built in, you know, old world kind of more white and probably well-to-do uh, groups. Uh, what is our role in leading them in, in embracing the change, in diversifying their uh, their uh, interest, their thirst for um, for for the new. Sometimes it's a challenge. Pam will probably agree with me. Sometimes you know we are in the arts, but then we find ourselves again and again with an audience that is not necessarily willing to go there. Uh, some of us have more adventurous uh, audience, and some depends on the community. But it also up to us to. A, lead, educate, have patience, definitely, and also correctly identify what are those um, pockets and what are those community um, facets that we need to address more importantly. I've struggled for some time. What is the sort of the diversity? What does it mean for art park community, for example? Our world is very, very white necessarily, but it's, uh, it's also rural. There are farmers, there are teachers, uh, there's different industry. And of course, there's the Iroquois, there's the Tuscarora, there's the people whose land we are on and have been all along. And that's an invisible community. They're all amongst us. The, the reservation is just around the corner. Yet we don't see, yet we don't, you know, that conversation is a tough one. And the culture is not an easy one. So finding the path where we're even beginning to see it is, it took time. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to say we are having now a very direct, very, very fruitful relationship, but that took time, that took took years to even see it. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of us to really, uh, as leaders, to identify what is, who are within our community that need to be elevating and who are that need to be educating and how we go about it. And that starts with the board as well, of course. Um, those are all the questions we are we're treading through, right? And uh, we need to escalate and then balance it with also giving it time. It's all, you know, it's, it, it's all what we do. But I think uh, our audience is, uh, is, should definitely be a partner in this conversation. Mm. I, I would agree definitely with, um, with Pam and, um, and, and Sonia in that it, it does take time um time but maybe not patience is where i would i would push back um my belief is that um a hypothesis a a, a kind of social hypothesis and um a, a kind of vision statement that is accompanied by an action plan is part of the rubric is, is those are some of the variables. Um, my experience both on stage and also as a, as an arts professional that, you know, that, that has worked at um, some really amazing organizations is that we, um, we sometimes think, okay, I have this goal, but it's really hard. There's, none of us are going to undo the patriarchy. None of us are going to undo um, social norms in any one performance in any one season. But I think that it's important to name a year as a, as a goal. I, I, again, like, um, no one is going to um, 
reverse the effects of climate change. But when politicians lay out plans, they say by the year 2035, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be carbon neutral, or we're going to lower gas emissions, or we're going to do this by the year 2035. So it sets us up then to have these kind of annual benchmarks and to gauge in a systemic way how we're going to get there. Um, again, I think that there's, there's an incredible amount, I've, I've seen an incredible amount of venture capital outside of the art sector that's devoted really to ideas. Um, somehow a lot of these con men, and for the most part they are men, say, I have this idea and, and generate investment in something that actually doesn't exist, but they are able to talk about um, a financial prop. They're able to talk about a program and a financial profit in a way that attracts investment. So um, what is the synthesis of um, a program and ethical profit um, as Rika Aino says? Um, the, the synthesis of a program and cultural profit. And is there a sector of our economy that can and will invest in that? Um, but what I think it, where, where I believe it starts is a, a clear articulation, a clear hypothesis and vision of where we want to be and a clear delineation of when we wanna be there, which is why I, you know, I've said to my colleagues, it's gonna take five years, but let's say now that it's gonna take five years so that we can systemically get there because otherwise um, we just kind of put it out and don't ever get there, you know? So th this, so yes, it is urgent. Yes, it does take time, but um, it cannot take too much more patience, you know? It's, it's like literally burning. There goes the, you know, the fire engine, <laughs> you know, coming down U Street. It's literally burning. So no time to be patient. Let's do it. With that, I wanna thank each and every one of you, Moody, Pam, Sonia and Bob, um, and Mike and um, our other our other interpreter, thank you so much for for being so supportive. Um, I I encourage us to um, take up the urgency of the moment and um, to be specific in what we're trying to uh, traffic and enable for us to reimagine the future and um, and and we look forward to to what that leads and how we do that together. So, uh, and Gloria, thank you so much for, for your interpretation too. Um, now I'd like to bring back our, our awesome president and CEO, Lisa Richards Tony, to close us out. Thank you all so much. Lisa? Good afternoon. I'm just waiting for a video. Okay. All righty, here we go. There we are. Well, this has been really inspiring. I, I, I just, I wanna thank everyone here. I don't wanna name each panelist, but please know you have my personal thanks. I am so inspired by my colleagues. I can't tell you. It is so deeply important. You know, this is called break room, but I think we may have to start thinking of this as the conference room. It's not just a place where conversations happen, but decisions happen. Uh, I think we've had on the table today some really important proposals for our future as a field that I implore us all to really consider. I know we at APAP will be doing that the same. So thank you everyone. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a huge opportunity for us to pivot and we must fully embody our shared responsibility in advocating for a more just performing arts industry a world actually, for black, brown, indigenous, LGBTQIA plus people, people with disabilities, all of us who are kin to face marginalization and oppression in the field and the world at large. And we can do better and we will do better. 
And until we do better, and thank you, Rika, for correcting me, then and only then will we as artists, as arts workers, be essential. So I take that, Rika, and I'm going to use that. Um, and we must think bigger with great specificity. Thank you, Mark. And we need the help of others. We need the help of others to help and help us to act, to move forward. Yes, it will take time, but not too much patience. So please stay with us. And if you're already a member of APAP, thank you so much for being a part. If you're not a part of APAP, I encourage you to look at us, look closely at our individual membership types, small and mid-sized presenter types, as well as the many payment options that we have. Visit our website and reach out to our membership team. Thank you, Sozo Creative. Thank you. Thank you, Rena Shagan Associates and Performing Arts Readiness for your partnership and support in this installation of APAP Break Room. I also want to thank the entire APAP board, particularly our chair, Karen Fisher. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank our remarkable staff, Krista Bradley, Caitlin Sarkey, Neil Narner Madison, and Robbie Otley for their outstanding work in producing this break room. Until next time, to everyone, please, Take care and be well. Have a good evening.